Hello, and thank you for joining us for the University of St. Francis Lecture Series, a virtual program of the Allen County Public Library. Today's program is COVID-19, a once-in-a-century pandemic. My name is Mark Eber. I'm the assistant manager of the Avoid Branch, and I am the host for today's program. This program is being recorded. In order to improve the quality of everyone's listening experience, your microphones have been muted. If you have a question or a comment, please use the chat function at the bottom of the screen. We will also use chat to facilitate a question and answer session at the end of the program. The purpose of this program is to present topics of interest and research information to the residents of Allen County and to provide a platform for the University of St. Francis faculty members to share their passion for their subjects with the library's patrons. To that end, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Michael Bischel, Associate Professor of Biology at the University of St. Francis here in Fort Wayne. He has a PhD in medical microbiology and immunology and specializes in host pathogen interaction and airborne infectious diseases. Would you please welcome Dr. Beechel? Thank you so much, Mark. I very much appreciate that introduction. And I wanted to just start off this evening by saying thank you very much for tuning in. It's been quite a challenging year and we've had to endure a lot as society and as families and individuals over the last year. And so for you to take the time to come to this lecture, I very much appreciate you watching it. And um, whether you're watching it live or watching the recording, thank you so much for your time. I also would like to thank the Allen County Public Library, Mark Huber, as well as the University of St. Francis for allowing me to give this presentation today. Um, to start off, I would like to um, give you guys a, a disclaimer statement. And so with this uh, disclaimer, um, I just want to say that the ideas that I'm about to present in this presentation um, are of my own, and they do not reflect the thoughts or the ideas of the Allen County Public Library or the University of St. Francis. I also would like to state that I am not a medical professional, I am not a provider, and I'm not providing medical advice. And finally, I'd like to mention that this presentation is not political in any way, shape, or form. Uh, one of the sad things of this pandemic has been the politicization of a viral pandemic. So thank you so much for tuning in today. A little bit about me. Um, the reason I'm maybe standing in front of you today, um, I grew up in a small town in Northwest Ohio, Wauseon, Ohio. And I actually attended the University of St. Francis as an undergraduate um, from 2004 to 2008. After which time, as Mark mentioned, I uh, did research in airborne infectious disease and biological weapons um, and studied in a CDC certified BSL-3 lab for about five years. After that, I had the opportunity to do research on antibiotic resistant infections and how those cause sepsis, and then how could we stimulate the human immune system to try to prevent people from having complications of those infections. After which time, I had a wonderful opportunity to actually return to the University of St. Francis, which I did in 2014. Since which time, I have been teaching the microbiology, virology, and several anatomy and physiology courses. So that's a little bit of um, why I may be standing in front of you today. Um, coming up with today's lecture was a bit of a challenge. Um, we've been living in a pandemic now for over a year. And so I thought to myself, what could I possibly tell you that you haven't already heard? What is something you haven't maybe heard in the news constantly over the last year? What's possibly a new angle? Um, everyone's suffering from a little bit of pandemic fatigue. And so the three areas that I want to touch on today um, is discussing pandemics and the history of pandemics in, 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 in human history, then maybe discussing how viruses have played a role in those pandemics, both historically and now, and then how specifically with our current COVID infection, infections that are ravishing our area, how could the vaccination campaign that's underway kind of alleviate those problems as we move forward? So to start off with today's lecture, I'd like to kind of discuss the impact of the pandemics on human history. And the reason I wanted to start with this today is that a term that I keep hearing used over and over again is unprecedented. You always hear this 
pandemic referred to as an un unprecedented um, event in human history. We've never had something like this occur before. And that, along with the other words that you can see in the word cloud, um, are kind of um, what we've been hearing. And so the first question that came to my mind was, well, is this event truly that unprecedented in human history? Um, this was further um, kind of ramped up in social media, so to speak. And one of the memes that really took hold towards the beginning of this pandemic is on your screen now. And it, it paints this picture that pandemics happen on the century, every century, every 100 years. And the question that I wanted to ask is, well, is that actually true? Um, first off, we can just say that the years that are on this slide are a little fudged. And so we'll be going over that. But before we can dive into this conversation too much, I wanted to uh, first clarify what actually is a pandemic. So on your screen, you can see a pandemic is defined as an epidemic occurring worldwide or over a very wide area, crossing international boundaries and usually affecting a large number of people. Now what's interesting to note in this definition is that this definition does not talk about population immunity, virology, or disease severity. Also highlighted on that slide, you notice that I highlighted the word epidemic. So how do we know even what an epidemic is in this definition? Because these words often get used interchangeably, however, they're not interchangeable. So what is an epidemic? An epidemic is an outbreak where there is a sudden increase of cases. And this could be of any infectious disease, um, it could be of a variety of illnesses, but if you see a sudden spike in those cases, it can become labeled an epidemic. Um, and so, it is an example, uh, you can see as SARS-CoV-2, the current virus outbreak, began spreading in Wuhan, China, it was termed an epidemic because it was a high number of cases in a localized area. And actually, it was declared an epidemic on New Year's Eve 2019. Personally, I won't forget that date because I remember watching uh, Dick Clark's Rockin' Eve, uh, waiting for the ball to drop, and uh, they cut into that broadcast to say that the um, new virus that was circulating in China um, had now been labeled an epidemic. And with my infection background, my ears perked up a little bit. Uh, from that point forward, uh, the cat kind of got out of the bag, so to speak. And as the virus began to spread over several countries and then affected many people, that label was then changed to be a pandemic. And that label of a pandemic happened on March 11th, 2020. So just a little over a year ago is when we officially have crossed over into this pandemic territory. So where I wanted to start today is, you know, do these pandemics only happen on the century, every century? And so here's an interesting slide that I found from an online open source infographics company that I think paints a wonderful picture. What you can see here are several colorful balls um, over time. And this on the side, you won't be able to probably read all the years, but this is human history going back around 2000 years. And what you'll notice is that there are several different pandemics labeled here. So this big purple one towards the back is representing the bubonic plague, also called Black Death. And that happened in, um, in the 1500s. And then as we move, or in the 1300s, I'm sorry. Then as we move forward, you could see smallpox. That pandemic really took hold in the year around 1520. Then as we move towards the foreground, you could see further pandemics, the 17th century Great Plagues, the 18th century Great Plagues. Um, cholera was a major issue in the eight, early 1800s and 1900s. And then as we moved on from there, we ran into Spanish flu in 1918. And then moving towards the next large ball that you see on the screen is the HIV AIDS pandemic that really took hold in the 90s. And so as you start to look at these numbers and these plagues, a few things start to tease out. First is it is not every 100 years, as social media would like you to believe. Uh, but seemingly once a century or so, 
um, there are pandemics that occur. Also, an interesting thing is when you look at the causes of these pandemics, a lot of the older pandemics, uh, starting with the bubonic plague coming forward to these cholera pandemics, are mostly bacterial in origin, causes of like Yersinia pestis and other bacterial infections. And we notice, starting around the uh, early 1900s, that those infections, those bacterial infections, switch over to become more viral infections. So starting around with Spanish flu, the majority of these pandemics are all viral in nature. So kind of an interesting transition. What could be causing that? Well, part of it has to do with society. As society developed and we got clean water supplies and had access to sanitary sewers, um, that really started to shut down a lot of the bacterial plagues that we used to see with the bubonic plague and the 17th and 18th century plagues. As we got access to clean water, those went away. Now, I don't want you to think that they just are gone. For example, cholera is still widely found in third world and developing countries that ha do not have great access to clean water supplies. And anytime there is um, lack of access to clean water, you can see cholera epidemics and possibly pandemics pop up. But again, as we move forward to more of these recent occurrences, we're seeing this trend or this switch towards viral infections. Another way of graphing this data is shown here. And what I would like to just show you is that um, they've chosen to graph this data as um, the number of fatalities. And so it's an interesting way of graphing data, but often that's how pandemics are measured, is in human life. And you could see um, the bubonic plague was devastating, 200 million lives lost. And as we work our way down this list, you can see that there is a large assortment of pandemics and our current COVID-19 pandemic, we're right approximately at 2.7 million lives lost. Um, so is this exactly unprecedented? Not exactly. Is it still devastating? Absolutely. To put it in a different way, um, this group, this visual um, capitalist um, data stream group, chose to graph the data as a factor of the world population. So you could see just how devastating the bubonic plague was. It actually wiped out over half of the world's population at that time. And then as the world's population increased, the percentage of, of the total world's population went down. However, currently with our COVID-19 pandemic, we unfortunately have lost 0.3% of the entire world's population. And so um, takeaway message from this first segment is pandemics have been part of human history for thousands of years. They do occur semi-regularly and though the dynamic of these pandemics is changing, uh, we can expect them to be part of humanity. So now that we know that these viral pandemics seem to be taking over, I think it would be good to understand some basics about viral infections. So I wanted to start at the beginning in case you're not exactly sure what a virus is. And so the definition that I want to talk about today is on the screen. It's an infectious, right, meaning that you can, trans, uh, you can infect either other people um, sometimes infections go from people to animals. Sometimes infections can go from animals to people. Those infections coming from animals to people are called zoonoses. But the fact remains that the infections, the virus is spreading from one cell to another. And then the next part of the definition, an obligate intracellular parasite. This part's very important. Um, viruses must be within cells to replicate. If the virus is not inside of a cell, it is not able to divide. Um, that's an important fact because even though viruses can persist outside of cells, in some cases for hours or maybe even a few days, they cannot replicate outside of a cell. And so that, that's where the obligate intracellular part comes. And they're a parasite. Uh, they're considered a parasite because they are using your own host cell machinery to do this replication process. If we physically look at the viruses on the right-hand side of here, there are two major categories, naked viruses on the left and enveloped viruses on the right. But they have a lot of commonalities. The first part is the genetic material. 
viruses will have some type of genetic material, which we'll talk about here in a moment. They also are going to surround and protect that genetic material with various proteins. And that protein coat is called a capsid. And both the naked and the enveloped viruses have that protein coat. In addition to that protein coat, they have these spike proteins, which we'll be talking about throughout the lecture. Again, they're called spike proteins or glycoproteins. They are very, very important for a, a virus's ability to bind to and infect your cells. And last but not least, some viruses are enveloped, meaning that they're surrounded by host cell membranes. So actually membranes from your cells are surrounding these viruses. And unfortunately, with SARS-CoV-2, our current virus, it is an enveloped virus. So those are the basic pieces or components of a virus. So if we drill down a little bit more, I think we should talk about the actual nucleic acid or the genome. When I say the word genome, genome is referring to the full complement of either DNA or RNA carried by the virion. Now, an interesting factoid is that viruses contain either DNA or RNA but never both. And that's interesting because as biologists, we very rarely get to say absolutes. And so to be able to say that we've never find a case of a mixed genome, a DNA RNA virus where they're combined, is kind of a fun fact. But viruses are either DNA or RNA. Why does that matter? What implications do those that have? Well, looking at this infographic, you can see that DNA viruses or RNA viruses are the two major categories. DNA viruses tend to be very complex. They have s several different skill sets that allow them to evade your own host cell immune systems. And they tend to be long-term infections. So if you were to get a DNA viral infection, in many cases, those viral infections can be lifelong infections. Your RNA virus infections here on the bottom are a different category. RNA virus infections tend to be much faster. They act incredibly quickly. These are the viruses where you wake up in the morning and you feel perfectly fine. However, by lunchtime you feel ill, you're puking your guts out, you're having a terrible day. In that case, you're probably dealing with an RNA virus. Many RNA viruses you're probably used to hearing about. For example, the common influenza virus Influenza virus is a single-stranded RNA virus. Um, interestingly enough, coronavirus causing our current pandemic is also a single-stranded RNA virus. So in that sense, in that particular absolute sense, um, coronaviruses and influenza, inf influenza viruses are similar, but their similarities very quickly stop there. Um, so just to be very clear, influenza viruses and coronaviruses are different categories, even though they have the same type of genome. Now, why does this matter? Why are we spending time talking about DNA or RNA? And it revolves around what is the virus doing once you're infected? What is it doing inside of the cell? And viruses follow what is called the central dogma of biology. The central dogma of biology is this process of moving genetic information around, and um, it's what all cells, as far as we can tell, follow this basic set of rules. So if we were to look at your cells inside of your body, you are going to have a cell membrane. Inside of that cell membrane, you'll have a nucleus, shown here in purple. And inside of that nucleus is where your DNA ha hangs out. This DNA is your genetic material. It's what makes you you. And that cell needs to use that DNA to tell the rest um, of, of the material in that cell what to do. However, however, that DNA is stuck inside of the nucleus. It cannot get out of the nucleus. It does not escape. So that being said, the DNA has to be able to send a message. And it does that through a chemical process called transcription, where it produces a molecule called RNA. All right, RNA, and in this case, we're specifically talking about mRNA, which stands for messenger RNA. Now, messenger RNA is different in that it is single-stranded, it's smaller, and it can physically fit through these small holes in the nucleus called nuclear pores. As that mRNA escapes the nucleus, it goes into the cytoplasm, or the water of the cell, and in that cytoplasm of the cell, it is read, that message of the RNA is read by a molecule called a ribosome. And that ribosome is going to produce a protein or a series of proteins based off of whatever that message says. 
Um, just to be clear, um, again, DNA shown here on the left is double-stranded, is made up of several different types of base, base pairs, and resides in the nucleus. RNA shown here on the right is single-stranded, has some similar base pairs, but others that are different, and it prefers to go into the cytoplasm. So if you have RNA being produced in the cell to make proteins, that's the normal strategy that your cells are using. It's also the strategy that your RNA viruses use to hijack your cells. So if a cell becomes infected with an RNA virus, that RNA is able to start producing viral proteins very quickly. And here's a brief video showing you how this process occurs. So here you can see this long stranded RNA. It looks yellow and it's hanging out in the cytoplasm um, in the cell. And what you're going to notice here is that messenger RNA is going to be attached onto by that ribosome, the host cell machinery, that is literally going to read that messenger RNA as a ticker tape. So as it pulls the ticker tape through the ribosome, it is reading the message and telling these green molecules, which are called transfer RNAs, to bring the red molecules to the ribosome in a very specific order. The red molecules that you're seeing here are amino acids. And as you stack amino acids together in a very specific sequence, like a pearl necklace, those amino acids become what are called polypeptides. And those polypeptides are what fold up to become a protein. So as you can see on your screen now, you can see that ticker tape being pulled through. The mRNA, the message is being read by the ribosome. And those amino acids are being linked together ultimately to create or translate the protein that is being made. So any virus that has mRNA involved can start making these viral proteins once infecting your cell. And you can see sticking out up top here, this red molecule is the new protein, the new viral protein being made. So using that mRNA, you can see how the virus more or less hijacks your cells using your own cell machinery to produce its own proteins. Once it's done that, this virus has effectively hijacked the cells and it's making its own proteins. Then what happens? Well, the virus basically turns into a Xerox machine where it starts making copies of itself. And it does that through a very specific process shown here. So again, we are just talking about that mRNA being read to make, get amino acids in a specific order to make viral proteins, allowing the virus to take over the cell. Once it does that, you, that you produce virions that will be released and they will absorb or attach to new cells. They will, be pen they will penetrate that cell, go into the cell. That virion will be uncoated in which in that new cell, it will start again making more copies of itself in a synthesis stage where it's literally making more copies of the viral proteins and the viral genome. Once all the pieces are produced, then they are assembled into new viruses and then released. So now we have a basic idea of how viruses get in and take over the basic machinery of your cells. So what's happening with this current coronavirus pandemic? Well, I think it's fair to start off by saying that coronavirus is a very general term. There are several different versions of coronaviruses. And so for the, the purpose of this talk, I think we should narrow it down. And what I've done here is I've narrowed it down specifically to the human to human transmissible coronaviruses that are able to cause pandemics. And you can see that there's been a series of them over time. So our very first human to human transmissible pandemic causing coronavirus was called SARS-CoV-1. And SARS-CoV-1 caused the disease severe acute respiratory syndrome or SARS. And as this virus took hold nearly 20 years ago, in 2002 and 2003, what happened is this virus um, was pretty nasty. It had a lethality rate, a general lethality rate of around 10%. And when it infected these countries in Southeast Asia, such as 
um, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, they had to come up with very aggressive strategies to try to contain the SARS virus. Ultimately, they were able to do that, but this virus was very lethal. Again, the overall lethality rate was above 10%. When you look at the elderly populations affected in SARS, the lethality rate was well over 60, 70, and in some cases, in some regions, over 80%. Luckily, these countries were able to get a hold of this pandemic quickly, and that and other factors caused it more or less to fizzle out by 2003. We dodged a bullet. After that, we had another outbreak of a coronavirus, human-to-human -human transmissible pandemic-causing coronavirus, called mers cov mers cov causes the uh, disease Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS. And MERS um, was interesting because it, it presented in the Middle East, and it wasn't nearly that infectious. So it didn't spread as good as our current pandemic does, but it was very deadly. The lethality rate of MERS was over 37%. So we had to take immediate action. And again, those Middle Eastern countries and some Southeast Asian countries had to be very aggressive at going at this virus. Again, after a couple of years, that virus, um, we got control over it. Which brings us now to our current virus. SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus that is causing our current pandemic. All right, um, this is an area that, that gets um, misspoken about several times. Um, it is COVID-19 is not the virus. SARS-CoV-2 is the virus. COVID-19 is the disease that the virus causes. So that distinction is important. COVID-19 literally stands for coronavirus disease. And 19 is because that's the year that it really took off. And so we want to focus the rest of this talk specifically on SARS-CoV-2. Now, luckily, when this pandemic took off in Wuhan, China, early in the infection, um, we kind of hit the jackpot. One of the scientists in China actually published online, free to access, the full sequence of our current coronavirus pandemic. Here it is. So when we look at SARS-CoV-2, it's about 30,000 base pairs long. So that mRNA strain that we looked at earlier, imagine it having 30,000 little base pairs here. And when they published that sequence, what it allowed scientists around the world to do is to very, very quickly start comparing this new coronavirus to previous versions of the coronavirus and also ascertain the structures of different parts of this infection. One very important part that we're going to spend a lot of time talking about is that spike protein that I showed you on the previous slide. And this is kind of a neat story. As the scientists have kind of mulled over this data over the last year, we have gotten very good at literally breaking down what is this virus doing inside of your cells and inside of your tissues. And a cool story about this was how did we actually get the structure of the spike protein? What happened was after the scientists in China published the sequence, there were scientists in the United States that are experts at coming up with structural um, components of proteins. However, during the pandemic, the head of the lab, so the PI, the head researcher of the lab, actually got stuck and, and isolated in Europe. And the rest of his lab was in America. And so they thought that they were kind of dead in the water. But using technology online, things like um, online social media and streaming, they used it to their advantage. And what this lab did is that the, the individual that was stuck in Europe would work during the day in Europe, and the rest of his lab would work during the day in America, and it basically created a 24-hour cycle where they worked literally every day for an entire month straight and came up with the physical structure of the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. And what's so special of that, about that is they were immediately able to recognize the area, the specific spot, and this is a, a zoomed in area of the specific spot, where the spike protein of the coronavirus is interacting with our own host cells. It interacts with a cell, a receptor called ACE2. And this ACE2 receptor is found very predominantly in our respiratory tract as well as in our GI tract, which is why this is a respiratory infection. 
And so what I hope you take away from this slide is that by knowing the genetics and the specifics of this pandemic, we are able to ascertain exactly how this virus is taking advantage of our cells and it also gives us very special and directed points that we can start to attack with therapeutics. Now there's another problem that we're dealing with. We know that the spike protein binds to the ACE2 receptor but we're also dealing with something in the news that you've probably heard about mutations. Viruses mutate whenever they replicate. So, for example, we talked about influenza earlier in this discussion. Influenza viruses mutate very, very, very rapidly. So rapidly, in fact, that we have to get new flu vaccines every single year. The reason we have to do that is that the strains have mutated so much in one year that the previous year's vaccine is mostly ineffective. Now, that sounds scary because we talked about how these coronaviruses are also RNA viruses. And so are we expecting that level of mutation? And the short answer is no. Um, luckily, coronaviruses have a mutation correction mechanism where they're able to fix most of the mutations that are occurring. So do mutations occur? Yes, they do. Do they change the way that the virus infects cells? Yes, they do. But are they happening at the same rate as other viruses? Luckily, no. What does this mean for us as we move forward? Well, even at the beginning of the pandemic, um, during my first pro bod uh, podcast, in fact, I um, put up this image, and this is a publication where they showed very early in the infections that there were several strains of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, and beyond that, several strains, there were many dozens of variants of the virus. Um, this is a fact that we're going to have to deal with as a society. In addition to these several strains and variants, and you couple that with the technology that we have today, we're actually able to track where do these variants end up around the world. So here's just a simple map showing where the eight major coronaviruses strains started and where they've traveled around the world. And for those of you that are in the Fort Wayne area, um, a cool experiment that we can look at is if we look at Fort Wayne, we can track the data and show that the two major strains that are currently here in Fort Wayne predominantly came from South Africa, which is um, this really kind of mutated, highly infectious strain that we're planning on taking over in terms of the dominant strain in this area. That South African strain came in through Chicago O'Hare Airport. Additionally, we can track the other major strain, which is the European strain, and that European strain we can track all the way through um, it was Detroit International. So not only do we know mutations are coming, and we know that mutations are here, we can track where they're coming from and where they're going. Luckily, the mutations that we're seeing, other than changing the infectivity rate, haven't changed the overall kinetics of what happens once you're infected. So what we're seeing is if an individual is exposed to coronavirus. So here you're seeing a graph that's showing the overall symptoms that a person that has coronavirus or COVID-19 might present with over time. And at the very beginning, this says minus five. So this is minus five days from when you start to feel sick. That's when you're exposed. So when you're initially exposed to coronavirus, we know that you will actually start replicating and producing that virus and shedding small amounts of virus in as little as an hour then that virus will start rapidly replicating over a five-day incubation period. And after that five-day incubation period, um, this is where you start to show symptoms. And so if you start feeling sick from COVID-19, that means that you were likely exposed and contracted the infection five days prior. Now from that point, from that, we'll call that day zero, where you start to feel bad, um, you will start to develop mild to moderate illness over the next week. So that lasts from day zero up to about day five or six post-infection. Now, this is where a turning point happens. Some people, if they show symptoms and they have mild illness, they'll start to get better over the next several days. So maybe for many individuals by 10, day 10, they no longer feel sick. However, other individuals will start to get worse 
over the coming days. And this is where we'll start to see around day eight or nine, post onset of symptoms, hospitalization, shortness of breath, breath respiratory distress, and possibly eventually ICU admission. So we know that this is the kinetics of what's happening once the virus gets in and starts presenting as a disease. So now that we know a little bit about how this virus is working inside of the cells, um, we should probably talk about the vaccine, right? We've had these, uh, a large array of new vaccines that have recently hit the market. And because they've hit the market so quickly um, and there's such a variety of vaccines, there's a lot of confusion there's a lot of frustration, and in some cases, there's a lot of distrust. And so what I hope to do here is kind of discuss these vaccines. How did we get them so quickly, and are they really effective? So let's size them up. This chart shows the majority of the, the major players that you may have heard of in the news. So the Pfizer uh, vaccine here in the United States is an mRNA vaccine. We'll talk about what that means here in a little bit. The Moderna vaccine is also an mRNA vaccine. Um, the Oxford University or AstraZeneca vaccine is going through the approval process now. It's more of a traditional vaccine using a viral vector to stimulate your immune system. And then the brand new uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine um, uses actually a cold virus to stimulate your immune system to produce the spike protein. And so each one of these vaccines are a little bit different. And uh, for, for that, we should kind of maybe talk about it. But I think the first issue that people are maybe the most skeptical or maybe even curious about is the timeline. Normally, when we develop vaccines, the runway is long. It takes typically five to 10 years to go from, I want to create a vaccine to injecting your first patient. Um, it takes a long time, it takes a lot of money, typically somewhere in the ballpark of a billion dollars. And so the first question that um, you hear over and over, if this process truly takes five to 10 years, then how do we have all of these different vaccines available only after a year? Fair question. And the answer has to deal um, with, with several factors. So if we look at this timeline here, again, normally five to 10 years, and you'll notice that it's linear. Every step happens one after another. The reason that those steps are linear is that these companies are investing, again, upwards of a billion dollars to try to develop the drug. So if you're a pharmaceutical company, you don't wanna continue developing something that's not going to work. And that's what largely extends this process, is events happen one after another. With the current virus production, however, um, we decided to throw everything in the kitchen sink after it. The development and discovery phase, which normally takes years in testing tens of thousands of molecules, that phase was greatly shortened because we used the tricks that we learned with SARS-CoV-1 and MERS, nearly 20 years of vaccine testing to put it towards, that information went towards the development of the SARS-CoV-2 or the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, as a matter of fact, SARS-CoV-1 at one point had upwards of over 90 vaccines in phase three clinical trials. And most of them, none of them actually made it through phase three clinical trials. That's why we call phase three clinical trials the valley of death. Usually it's just pharmaceutical companies throwing millions and millions and billions of dollars into a hole and never getting a product out of the end. Things were different with COVID-19, however, because we used the lessons that we learned from SARS and MERS to expedite the way that we discovered and went after this current pandemic. The lessons that we had learned is that with SARS and MERS, we know that we need to attack that spike protein. If you can neutralize the spike protein, you can neutralize the virus. So that lesson told us right where to focus from day one. Then the preclinical trials and the clinical trials, so phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials were very, very quickly accelerated. We discussed how those scientists discovered the structure of the spike protein in one month. That's unprecedented. 
What's also unprecedented is from the time that there was a discovery of that spike protein structure to the time that the first patient was injected for phase one clinical trials was 14 days, two weeks. That's incredibly fast. The other thing that was accelerated was, in this graph, I don't know that shows it the best, was the manufacturing process. The manufacturing process actually happened during the clinical trials, and so maybe this blue section should be stacked with the human clinical trial portions. Because what ultimately ended up happening was the pharmaceutical companies were taking orders from governments um, for millions and millions of dosages. And so they said, look, we can't wait to see if this works before we start making it. Let's make it, and if the vaccine works, we can use it. If it doesn't work, we'll throw it in the trash can. But because of the amount of money that governments were throwing at these companies to accelerate this process, there wasn't the risk. There wasn't the risk of failing. And so I'm sure there are several vaccines that have never made the light of day, that failed clinical trials that were just thrown in the trash can. But luckily, we've gotten several new ones. So that really helped shorten the runway. Another thing that really helped is the advent of these mRNA vaccines. mRNA vaccines are a little bit different than traditional vaccines. What happens with an mRNA vaccine is that you make synthetic mRNA. In this case, that will make the protein, the spike protein, and you put that into a small membrane-bound vesicle, and then you inject it into someone's arm. And what this principle does is it follows the same ideas as the central dogma of biology. If I can take my cells and teach them by injecting mRNA directly into the cells, if I could teach this cell how to make spike proteins, I can warn the immune system that this virus is coming and this is what the spike protein looks like so you can start producing antibodies. So we had the distinct advantage of knowing that we need to attack the spike protein and we even knew what part of the spike protein we needed to attack. That allowed vaccine developers to go up to the genetic sequence up here and say, we are going to look at this section of mRNA as um, the, the focus section for the clinical trials. So when you are getting an mRNA vaccine, you are literally only getting a small segment of mRNA that accounts for the small segment of viral proteins that is going to allow you to produce effective antibodies. Really cool revolutionary strategy. That's one piece. The other piece that we have to deal with in society and the development of these new vaccines is what vaccine do you trust? And this is actually a really neat story that was put together um, by a company called Vox. They do great little short video clips. I'll post it online on my uh, YouTube channel for you guys to watch. But I took some screenshots so you guys could get at least the story. Um, there's a lot of options, right? You have Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson. Russia has the Sputnik vaccine. Um, you have Novavax. You have the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine from the UK. Which one should you take? Which one's the best? And this is where things can get a little confusing. For example, in the media, some of you might remember this news conference. So this is a news conference with the Detroit, uh, the mayor of Detroit, and the government was going to send Detroit 6,000 dosages of the new Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And the mayor of Detroit refused it. He said, no, I, I don't want the Johnson & Johnson vaccine because it's not the best, and I only want the best for my citizens. Well, what was this mayor referring to when he said the best? Likely, he was looking at the efficacy rate of vaccines. So this graph here shows you the efficacy rates of the various vaccines that are currently being distributed. So you have the Pfizer vaccine, which we uh, know is 95% effective in its clinical trials. The Moderna vaccine, was 94% effective in clinical trials, which by the way, these numbers are amazing. Normally for a vaccine to be considered good, if you can get above 50%, you're having a good day. So these numbers, these 95, 94% numbers are absolutely amazing. So when the 66% efficacy rates came out for Johnson & Johnson, 
That's why that mayor had become skeptical. I don't want that. I want the 95% of efficacy. So the question we should ask is, how are these numbers actually calculated? So when you do a vaccine trial and you go through phase one, two, and three clinical trials, after that phase three clinical trial, you have literally tested tens of thousands of individuals. And to test those tens of thousands of individuals, what you do is you take a population and you split them into two buckets. And those two buckets are the one, the placebo group, that get injected with saline or water, not the vaccine. And then you have the vaccine group, the group that gets injected with your experimental vaccine. After those two groups have had their injection, they're allowed to go back out into the world into society like normal, and they mingle around, just like they normally would, social distancing and masks and all that included. Now, these individuals are tracked by the pharmaceutical companies to see who gets sick, who gets COVID, who doesn't get COVID, are there side effects, does anyone die? All of those numbers are very aggressively tracked. And for example, during the Pfizer trial, phase three clinical trial included 43,000 participants. And of those 43,000 participants, only 170 people ended up getting sick. So how do we calculate the efficacy of the virus with that 170 people? Well, what you do is you say, what group were these individuals a part of? And in this specific case of the Pfizer vaccine, the placebo group um, contained 162 of those sick individuals, whereas the vaccine group contained eight of those sick individuals. So let's say we were to run this experiment again and there was equal people, the um, equal numbers on both sides. The placebo and the vaccine had equal numbers on both sides. That would mean that the vaccine had no efficacy, zero efficacy. However, with this specific example from Pfizer, this vaccine showed an efficacy rate of 95%. Now, what most people interpret that 95% efficacy to mean is that if I were to take here on the left, if I were to take 100 people and inject 100 people with the vaccine, five people are going to get sick. That's how most people interpret that. And that is not true. What a 95% efficacy rate means is that if you took two people, one person that has the vaccine and another person that does not have the vaccine, and both individuals were exposed to SARS-CoV-2 virus, that means that the vaccinated individual would be 95% less likely to get sick. All right, and that is per exposure to COVID-19. So in this case, this person is 95% less likely to get sick than the unvaccinated individual. The other thing when to consider when looking at these efficacy rates between these different vaccines is are we comparing apples to apples or apples to oranges? And the devil's in the details. So if we were to look at this graph here, this is a graph of all of the new COVID-19 cases in the United States over the last year. And what you could see is that starting last March, we saw an increase, then we saw a lull, then we saw a spike after 4th of July, and then um, kind of another lull before the holidays. But then after Thanksgiving and Christmas, we saw an explosion of cases, which have then since started to decrease. What's interesting is if we look at when these different vaccines did their clinical trials in the United States, both um, Moderna and Pfizer did their clinical trials um, in the late summer, early fall, when there was a small amount of new cases, relatively speaking. So the opportunity for these individuals to actually be exposed to COVID was significantly lower when compared to Johnson & Johnson. Johnson & Johnson's clinical trials actually occurred over the winter months when we had this large spike. And so the opportunity for those Johnson & Johnson individuals to be infected was significantly higher. This is what I mean by an apples to oranges comparison. Also, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine studies took place in the United States. 
Johnson & Johnson not only tested in the United States, as shown here, but they also tested internationally in countries like South Africa and in Brazil. And what you'll notice in South Africa and Brazil, not only did they have cases, but they had the variants, these other strains. And we already know that this South African variant is approximately 50 to 70 percent, that number is a little squishy, more infectious than the main strain that we've been dealing with in the United States. So when the Johnson and Johnson vaccine says that they have an efficacy rate, 67 percent of those cases were of that variant in South Africa. So in reality, um, each vaccine has a nuance to it in terms of when was the clinical trial performed and where was the clinical trial performed. But at the end of the day, with any vaccination campaign, there is this kind of scale or achievement that you're trying to get. In an absolutely perfect scenario, a vaccine would result in nobody being infected. All right? If you had to compromise a little bit, you'd say, all right, it's all right if people are infected, but I don't want them to be symptomatic. All right? If it was a little worse, you might say, okay, um, I'll settle for moderate symptoms. Maybe I don't feel good. Maybe I get a mild fever, but I'm otherwise okay. All right? These are dream scenarios. This is, um, it doesn't happen very often. Um, in reality, when we're dealing with an international pandemic, we're trying to prevent things like death. Can we stop people from dying? Can we stop people from being hospitalized? And can we alleviate those most severe symptoms? And so if we focus on this right-hand side and we compare all of the vaccines that are currently being distributed across the globe today, there's a striking piece of data I want you to see. Regardless of the vaccine being used, every single one of these vaccines had 100% efficacy against death and against hospitalization. So that means regardless of the vaccination type, if these people were vaccinated, they were not hospitalized and they did not die. So when you ask yourself the question, what vaccine should I get? Or you ask the question, which vaccine will keep me out of the hospital? The answer is the vaccine that will help me end, end the pandemic. And the answer to that is all of them. All of our current data is showing that any of these vaccinations are going to help get us through and get us over the edge. And so ultimately, what's the goal? What's the goal of this vaccination campaign? And something that I just unfortunately don't have enough time to go into today is this concept of herd immunity. But this is where we want to get. We want to get to the point where enough people have been vaccinated that this virus can no longer spread throughout a population. What that means is if enough people are vaccinated, or enough people were to get the actual infection and get sick, if that percentage gets high enough, we will enjoy the benefits of what is called herd immunity, where we will be protected as a global society. And that number, that percentage that we need to get to varies from virus to virus, but we enjoy herd immunity for many infections, things like measles, mumps, rubella, these infections that used to be rampant across the United States and the world, polio, smallpox, have now been greatly diminished and in the last case of smallpox eradicated because of vaccination campaigns and we're enjoying herd immunity. So let's look at the numbers. I pulled these up this morning and in Indiana, as of five o'clock this morning, there were 970,000 fully vaccinated people. All right, so then I started asking myself, okay, that's 970,000 people that are fully vaccinated, both doses, if they need both doses, everything looks good. Let's also, just for fun, this is just for argument's sake, let's also include the people that have already been reported or tested positive for being infected, All right? Because you do get some protection for a small period of time, perhaps, 
if you've been naturally infected with the virus. And so let's just play a best case scenario game. If you combine the 970,000 people that have been fully vaccinated with the 679,079 individual um, positive test cases, and we added those together, that means that there have been 1.649240 people quote unquote protected um, here in Indiana. Indiana's total population is somewhere in the ballpark of 6,760,000 people. So if we do the math and we say 1.6 million people have been either vaccinated or have been infected, and there's 6.7 million people in Indiana, that gives us a protection rate of 24%. Now, in order for us to enjoy the benefits of herd immunity, knowing the properties of this virus, what we need to get to is 60%. So are we there yet? No. Are we on our way? Yes. And this is where that vaccination campaign could very, very quickly get us over the hump so we can enjoy each other's company, maybe some less masking and less social distancing. So overall, in today's lecture, I hope you have a better appreciation of the impacts that pandemics have had on us in terms of global human history. I hope you understand a little bit more about the basics of viral infection and some specifics about coronavirus in general. And then lastly, have a better appreciation, understanding, and just feel more informed about our current vaccination campaign. So I wanted to end today by saying thank you. Um, if you want to contact me, my email is on the screen. I also have put up a QR code that you could scan with your phone that will send you to my podcast page if you wanted to look at some podcasts that I released at the beginning of this pandemic. There's a lot of great information that my students in my virology class put together to try to inform the public a little bit more detail than I provided today about our current coronavirus outbreak. So thank you so much for your time, and I really look forward to your questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That thank was you. Terrific. As Dr. Beechel said, if you'd like to ask questions or make comments, please feel free to do so by uh, by entering the text into the chat function of, um, of your Zoom uh, program. I will then read your questions to him uh, so he can respond. Uh, earlier, someone asked, um, uh, thank you, Dr. Beechel, for the presentation. There are several theories and myths about the origin of the virus, of the virus lab created, uh, created in a lab, I think. Yeah. Was, or Alice, can you speak? Can you talk to that a little? Yes, great, great question, fantastic question. And uh, what, I, what I can tell you is that the CDC and the World Health Organization, both organizations, are very, very good and well-equipped at tracking the origins of viral infections. And something that's really amazing is they've actually been able to track this coronavirus outbreak back to what we call patient zero, or the first infected person from this uh, pandemic. And what is interesting about that infected person is that that person became sick, they became symptomatic on December 8th, 2019. Okay, so we know that that person was exposed five days before that. Another interesting fact is that individual, that patient zero, did not physically go to the market that is widely attributed to the origins of the outbreak of this current pandemic. However, that individual's parents did. So we have a case where we know that we can track things back to patient zero. We know that that person didn't go to the market. The individual's parents did. And then additionally, the World Health Organization has been able to show simultaneous transmission of this virus um, in the region. Uh, additionally, with all of the genetic tools that we have, it's pretty easy to dissect out viruses and, or bacteria and tell if they've been genetically manipulated. Um, using um, evolution and other um, investigative techniques, 
you can tell if a virus or a, a bacteria has been tampered with, so to speak. And those studies have been done, and there has been no factual evidence to show that this was a man-made or constructed viral infection. Now, I agree that it is interesting that there is a BSL-4 facility in Wuhan, China, but the fact that there is a BSL-4, which is the highest level where you study the most dangerous of the dangerous things, that does not inherently mean that this is a constructed pandemic. There is no genetic evidence pointing to that, and the World Health Organization has been able to actively track the progression of this infection. Wonderful question. Thank you. Um, I keep hearing that although um, the virus is not particularly deadly, it is highly infectious. Yeah. And we've t yeah, you talked about how it is mutating on some level each Correct. time it's transmitted. Correct. Will the medical professions have to chase the virus over time in terms of developing new vaccines like they do with the flu vaccine each year? Or, yeah. or will it be stable enough that they won't have to do that so much? That's a wonderful question. And um, the answer is in, the, in between. Our current best guess is based off of the mutation rates that we're seeing, the new strains that are emerging, the variants that are coming off of those strains. Our current best guess is that the vaccines that we're administering today should be effective for at least two and a half years, maybe three years, before we'll have to start doing maybe an updated vaccination or something like that. So it's not, it's not projected to be like the flu vaccine where you need a flu vaccine every year to protect yourself, but we are anticipating just because of how widespread this pandemic is, and the characteristics of the mutations that this virus isn't going to just fizzle out and go away and that we will have to have vaccination campaigns moving forward every few years or so. Okay, great. Um, the governor just uh, announced that we're le lessening some of the restrictions and people all around, the, politicians all around the country yeah. are navigating that, you know, and as you say, it's a political matter in some ways, so it's yeah. really difficult to know what yeah, I don't want to describe any motives to anybody, but sure, what are you telling sure. your friends and relatives at this point? Yeah, so what I, what I like to tell my friends and relatives is we're close, but we're not there yet. We can see the finish line, right, but we haven't crossed it. And so in some ways, the end of the pandemic might be just as hard as the beginning of the pandemic. In the beginning of the pandemic, we were learning what was happening. In many ways, this is the first time in most people's lives that they've seen science play out live, right? And science done in real life, in real time, is dirty and messy. But as our knowledge improves, we get a better idea of what's going on. And that's kind of where we are now. And after a year of rules changing, requirements changing, people are suffering very severe pandemic fatigue, emotional distress, financial distress. And so what's important to realize is this last section might be the hardest, but it's still necessary. And so what I tell my friends and family is, you know, you're out in public, mask up for the time being. If the public chooses to go get vaccinations, and that's ultimately going to be a choice, if we can get that herd immunity to 60%, we can go back to life basically as normal. But we have to make a deal as society that we're going to vaccinate and we're going to get to that 60% as quick as possible. In an ideal situation, if the vaccines were available, I could see a dream scenario where by the end of April, beginning of May, we could be back to the new normal if people vaccinate. Uh, what do you think the... Uh, continuing effect of, well, I'm thinking like in terms of third world countries, for instance, I yeah. can understand that the AstraZeneca vaccine is relatively cheap compared to the Moderna and yes. the Pfizer vaccines, yes. for example, so there's some, and easier to transport and whatnot, so yes. there's some hope that they'll be able to mass produce it and send it to third world countries affordably and things like that. Yeah. And you have apparently a sp big spike in cases in Europe and whatnot. Yeah. Is, what is the what does the global compact have to be <laughs> yeah so that international business can continue that i can go visit my relatives in 
Germany, if I have them, or you know something like that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And and the the socioeconomic, the the monetary side of things is quite complex. We know from past vaccination campaigns that if you want third world countries and destitute areas to get vaccinated, the vaccine has to be cheap, typically a dollar a dose um, for third world countries to even have a shot. Mm. And so the fact is, is this is not gonna be um, a symmetric distribution. There's going to be asymmetry where the rich countries, frankly, are going to get vaccinated first. Hopefully um, we can distribute um, vaccines to third world countries, especially those cheaper ones that don't need the aggressive refrigeration. Um, but it's going to take longer. It's going to take more time because, frankly, the money's not there. Yeah. Um, globally, we are going to have to hit herd immunity. Coronavirus is going to stay around and it is going to have an impact on our lives personally and professionally as long as we are under that herd immunity stress uh, threshold. So the quicker that the world can find a way to get there, to work together as for the global good, the better that things will be for businesses. There's been several analyses that have been done on past pandemics, and it has shown that when we vaccinate aggressively, it's actually better for businesses because the um, society gets back to normal quicker. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not claiming to be a business expert, <laughs> but the data has shown in historically, that if we vaccinate faster, business benefits. Um, take advantage of this moment. If anybody else has a comment or a question that I'd like to ask, I'm going to do a little reading, but I will cut back in to you if you'd like to, to ask Dr. Bichel a question. Um, as Dr. Bichel mentioned, um, if you'd like additional information about COVID-19. He is the host of the Just the Facts podcast dedicated to uh, uh, COVID-19, which is on his YouTube page. If you would like to see this lecture again or share it with others, it will be uploaded to the library's YouTube page in a few days. You can access our YouTube page by clicking on the YouTube icon at the bottom of the library homepage at www.acpl.info. From there, if you click on the Channels tab and then the Access Fort Wayne tab and uh, then the USF Lecture Series playlist, you will see uh, not only Dr. Bichel's lecture, but all of the lectures in the series. Uh, by the time his is uploaded, there should be a total of 20 for me to choose from. Um, please join us for the next University of St. Francis. Uh, virtual lecture, which will be in two weeks, uh, or yeah, on two weeks, on Wednesday, April 7th at 6.30, when Dr. Michael, uh, Matthew, rather, Hoff, Associate Professor of Kinesiology, will present Aging Doesn't Have to be Painful. If you are interested in that program or any of our other upcoming virtual programs for adults, children, and teens, please visit the Allen County Public Library website, again, at www.acpl.info. You will find a comprehensive listing of events under the Events tab located at the top of the page. Events do require you to register in advance, so please take note of that. If you have any follow-up questions or comments regarding the information shared today or need additional resources of any sort, please contact or email us at ask at acpl.info. The staff there will forward your questions and comments to the appropriate personnel for follow-up. On behalf of Dr. Bichel and the, and, the, and the staff here at Access Fort Wayne, thank you for attending today's lecture and have a good evening.